this morning. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. 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 Well, I'm glad to see you. I know that uh, we are, you know, summer's ending. Uh, people are getting back into routine, got the kids back in school uh, this past week for some. So I know some are going uh, to school this week. So I know there's a lot of adjustments that are happening, but I know we still got some people that are coming in. So we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Thank you uh, for making Living Word Baptist Church your place of worship today. We want to welcome everyone that is watching online as well. I know we've got some members that are watching online today, so we just want to say thank you as well for making this your place of worship today. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. 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 I don't know about you, but I feel something great's going to happen today. Amen. I just, I just feel it. I just, you know that feeling of the, something good's going to happen today. So I'm looking forward to this, this service. I'm looking forward to the sermon. Just really looking forward to everything that's going to happen today. I'm so thankful for our praise and worship team that's going to lead us today. So uh, really and honestly, I just want you to just to sing out, praise the Lord today, and let the Lord speak to us through the singing, through the, the Bible reading, everything that we do today. Let's just give it over to the Lord. Leo, you come up and lead us in a word of prayer. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, church. And it, yes, it is a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And how many times we have been in a situation that we don't want to pray just because we are so depressed and so tired um, or discouraged. Mm -hmm. But I want to encourage you, uh, church, to press on, don't give up, and pray more. So the times that we don't feel like praying, pray more. Set an alarm or whatever we need to do. I think this is the time for us as a church to pray and pray more. And I really yeah. feel like that, that in my heart. So, so Father, thank you that to this day you still at work. You still work in our lives. You still working in us. You still working with us. And glory be to the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And Lord, I pray today for your church. I pray that you would encourage your church, give your church strength. And I pray in the name of Jesus for those individuals that are going through some sort of difficulties and challenges. And I pray, Father, would you visit, would you strengthen those individuals? I pray, Father, would you draw them closer to you, that they feel your presence, that they know that you are God and God alone. I pray, God, for your provision, and you are God of restoration. For, for, for you are God of restoration in every corner of our lives, and we, we give all the glory to you. For nothing can compare to the love of God, and we thank you so much in advance. And I pray, God, visit them, visit them all, bless them, restore every brokenness, every areas of their lives that they are not aligned. And I pray, God, restore, restore the health, restore the hope, restore the strength, restore the finance. And I pray, God, I pray, listen to the prayers and let them know that you are God and God alone. And I pray for our praise and worship today. Let it be honoring and pleasing to you. Let our hearts rejoice in your presence. Let their word be preached today. We pray for a special anointing on our pastor that let he preach the word and the word of God that is transforming. We thank you so much for the victory, God. We know, we know that we can depend and rely on you for you are God and God alone. So we surrender all to you. We give all the glory back to you, for worthy is the Lamb of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank amen. you, church. If you can stand for the worship. Hallelujah. 
are wonderful this morning. Absolutely. It is such a blessing to be here and to do this every Sunday. Mm -hmm. What a blessing it is to be here this morning. And every time we get to come to this house. This next song, I can only think of just one thing that this song, Amazing Love. It says, I don't know how many times we say it in this song, but it's so powerful. I think we should really, as we're singing this, we should pray that God does open our hearts this morning, opens our minds, and just to hear his word being preached this morning. How exciting is that? So let's think about that. Let's just say a prayer as we're singing. Just open our hearts this morning. And I'm trying not to say anything, <laughs> but I can't help it. Thinking about the last <laughs> song that we sang. When, and I say this almost every single time we sing it, but it, that song means so much to me. When it says, amazing love, I know it's true. It is true. Amen. The world will try to tell you it's a lie, but Jesus loves us, and he died. When he hung on the cross, he had every one of us on his mind. He already knew before we were born, and that is monumental. There's nothing in life you can count on like that. So I just had to say that again. <laughs> And I'll say it next time we sing the song, I'm sure. But it means so much to me. Open the eyes. 
eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. This morning, before we dismiss our children, I would like for Emily and Paul, will y'all come up here for just a minute? They want to make a, an announcement um, to you. Um, we have, um, last week, maybe, before I get to that, last week we were missing a lot of our members, and, and I knew that a lot of you members were not going to be here, so what I did is I put on our front sign the whole list of members that weren't going to be here. We had, we had five visiting families last week that didn't come back. And I'm going to do that again. I'm going to put on the, on, the, on the sign out front, these families are not going to be here, and just see who comes back. And then I'm going to start testing that. You know, what families is, is keeping the business? That, what? <laughs> but anyways, last Sunday, last Sunday, Paul and Emily uh, had a little short meeting with our uh, volunteers that are working with the children. Uh, let's get them a microphone. Um, and they they just kind of want to share a couple of things to the church. And uh, there you go. Come over here so okay. they can see you. <laughs> hey, good morning. Um, so like Pastor said, last week we were able to meet with quite a few volunteers who are interested in being a part of children's ministry. And um, like he said, a lot of people were out of town. So next Sunday after church, we'll be holding a second meeting for anyone else who would like to serve in any capacity, whether that's nursery, just assisting, being a backup assistant, teaching, um, helping on Wednesday nights, whatever that is. Um, teens and young adults, it, it doesn't just have to be people with kids or grandparent age either. This is open to everyone, um, especially if your spiritual gift is in um, teaching. So. Um, it's a lot of fun back there with the kids and we're trying to grow this program. We've chosen a really solid curriculum that kind of outlines everything for you and we'll go through all of that. We'll try to support everybody who wants to be a part of this as best we can. Um, and at that meeting next week, you'll be able to ask any questions. Um, even if you're hesitant, you're like, I'm not sure, maybe just show up and we can kind of figure that out with you. And if this is not your area at all, um, just please pray for the children's ministry here at the church. 
Yeah, good, good. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So what she didn't tell you were the paychecks that we're going to be handing out for those volunteers. I think she was going to keep those for themselves. No, I'm just kidding. But I, I want to say thank you to all of our volunteers that have been working with our children that are going to continue to work with our children. Uh, that department is growing. Last week we had 11 children down there just near in Children's Church. So the need is rising. We're having more visitors. We have more families that are moving into the, the community. So we need your help. We need, uh, like what they were trying to say, we're teaching a curriculum during that time. So it's going to be really, really good. So uh, make sure that you volunteer for that. So we're going to go ahead and dismiss our children. Uh, they're going to go ahead and head out. Um, Paul and Emily are heading to that back door. So make your way that direction. All right. Good to see these children with us. All right. Well, as they're leaving, well, I want to bring you up to speed of what happened yesterday. We had our food distribution yesterday, and it was wonderful. We served over 25 families, actually 27 families. Um, even after we shut it down, families were still coming up, knocking on the door, trying to get food, trying to get backpacks. We gave out 62 backpacks full of supplies yesterday, and that was, that was wonderful. Uh, so we, we need to keep that in mind for next year, going back to school, and maybe even during the, the school season, we try to hand out some school supplies. That was a big need yesterday. In fact, they would have rather have had the school supplies than the food. So that was a, that was a very big need. Uh, we had 25 backpacks that were donated by Grace Bridge, and we're so thankful for that. And then we had another donation of 36 backpacks that were already boxed up, ready to go, uh, that were delivered to Tim. And that was wonderful because every one of them came in handy. Uh, we, we needed one more backpack, and I went on the search. I said, there's got to be a backpack here somewhere. And I finally found one, put some supplies into it, and gave it to that last family as, as they were leaving. So it was a wonderful day. We had 25 families served. We had over 45 volunteers that showed up yesterday, which is wonderful. Absolutely <laughs> wonderful. And here's the best news. We had one soul saved. One soul saved. That's worth it all. Now, when I say one soul saved, we don't know what decisions left out of here because there was a lot of seeds planted yesterday. There was a lot of uh, message that was given, and some of them said, i got to go think on this, I've got to pray about this. So I know we planted a lot of seeds. Uh, Leo, Eric, and uh, Renee, thank you all so much. And Suzanne, where's Suzanne at? Has she already gone to lunch? she already go to lunch? So, oh, <laughs> look, she just walked in the door. <laughs> Suzanne, I'm sorry, don't leave the room. We're going to talk about you. <laughs> but anyways, we're so thankful for our encouragers because they were sharing the gospel, uh, and, and we were praying for them during that time. So it was really, really, really good. So, so thankful uh, for that ministry. It, it is really doing a, a big impact in our community. So we want to keep doing that. We need your support on that. Um, we've got the funding. We've got the volunteers. We, we just we just needed to do it, and so we just praise God for that. I'm so thankful for everything that is going on. And I just want to praise you as a church. I just want to say thank you for your uh, your willingness to come out on on a on a day that it's 150 degrees, standing out there in the sun, getting sunburnt. I mean, it's that that's that's it right there, and I, and I appreciate that. I really do. I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, so uh, let's get into the message this morning. I'm excited this morning because I'm going to begin a new uh, series as, as we journey for the next four weeks. I thought this was only going to be a two-week message, but the deeper that I got into it and, and allowed the Lord to speak to me through it, it just opened the door for four weeks. So you'll see what I'm talking about here in just a minute, but we're uh, naming this series More Like Jesus, More Like Jesus, and uh, the, the emphasis is coming from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And we're going to read Ephesians 4, 1 through 6 every week. You're going to get the big picture here in just a minute. But I hope that you have the opportunity for the next four weeks uh, to attend. If you can't attend, to watch online. Because uh, Paul has a lot to say to the church. And he's specifically writing to the church at Ephesus. Uh, but before we read the passage of Scripture this morning, let's take a little moment and, and let's, let's spend it in prayer. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning because how many of you need a word from God? Amen. Every one of us. That's why we're here this morning. We need the Lord to speak to us. Father, we surrender ourselves to you now. 
Lord, help us to block out everything that is taking our mindset, that is stealing our, our joy. Lord, we just want to concentrate on you. Father, you have something to say to us today. And Lord, we've worshipped you, we've praised you, we've sung to you. And now, Lord, as we open your word, will you speak to us? Will you give us a message that we need to hear? Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to be in this building even right here, to worship together, to worship you, because, God, we know that you are our God. You're our Savior. You're our Master. You're our Lord. And, Father, we thank you for that. Lord, help us now. Speak to us. And it's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Before I get to it, okay, maybe you're opening your Bibles to it. That's, that's, go ahead. Go ahead and open your Bibles. But I, l let's bring you up to speed of what's taking place in the book or the letter of Ephesians, because really it's a letter that Paul wrote. We call it a book in the Bible. But Paul has spent the first three chapters uh, primarily talking about doctrine. Okay, he's talking about the theology of what it means to be saved. He's talking about the works that God has done through Jesus Christ. And, and by the way, there's nothing we can do to earn our way to heaven. There's, there's nothing that we can do as far as being a good person or doing something to earn our way to heaven. It's about believing in Jesus. And that's what Paul's doing for the first three chapters is, is telling us about what God has done, how much God has loved you, and he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And then we come to chapter 4, and he says, okay, now all that this has been said, this doctrine, now we're going to talk about your duty, okay, and our duty as Christians. So we come into uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, I, Paul's talking, therefore... The prisoner of the Lord. He refers to himself as a prisoner. Now, he's already been talking the, f the first three chapters about what it means uh, about the grace of God and, and about what it means to be saved. And now, it, it's almost like he's reintroducing himself. And, and now he's trying to make a, a special purpose starting in chapter 4. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you, watch this, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. W what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it look like to be a Christian? When, when we go out into the world today and we see everybody, can, can we just go, oh, that person looks like a Christian. Oh, man, uh, that, that man on the back row looks like he's a Christian because he's in a suit today, right? I mean, he must be a Christian because he looks like a Christian on Sunday. Right? What does it mean? And this is what Paul's trying to say. Walk worthy. In other words, what you do, and this is what I'm trying to say. We, we've heard the doctor, and now it's the duty. And what Paul's trying to say is now what you have seen and heard of what God has done for you, this is what's required of you in response of what God has done for you. In other words, there's an appreciation of what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know, sometimes at Easter we make it a big deal about Jesus dying on a cross and Jesus arising from the dead. But, you know, that's the whole reason that we worship every Sunday is that our Savior's alive and we live for Jesus Christ. And so that ought to make a, a difference in the way that we walk. And, and that word walk is our behavior as a Christian. In other words, when we became Christians, something changed in our life. Something changed. A new purpose was given to us. Something uh, uh, happened inside of our soul that now... We belong to Jesus Christ. We are a child of the King, and there's a difference. You know, uh, I, I think it's important that we understand who we belong to, and sometimes that'll make an impact of what we say and what we do. In verse 2 it says, With all lowliness, or the King James Version, the old King James, I grew up on King James, it says humility. With all lowliness, humility, and gentleness, with long suffering, that's patience. Bearing with one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called 
and one hope of your calling. What he's trying to say here is that when we come into the family of God as Christians, we're one. There's a unity that we belong together as a family. We belong together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not individuals. We're part of a bigger team. We're part of something that makes a difference. And then he says in verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. See the unity? He's using one, one, one. And by the Spirit of God, we become one. And that makes a difference as a church. The Spirit draws us together. And when you see that there is a togetherness, there's unity within a body of believers, the Holy Spirit is there. Folks, if you ever want to go to a church and say, is God here? Is God part of this church? You gauge it on the unity of the church. And we're going to see some of this take place here in just a minute because there are disputes, there's complaints, there's all sorts of things that the devil's trying to interrupt in the church and even in your personal lives. And we've got to be aware of these things. But when we are drawn by the Spirit, it's all about one. And that's what the Spirit does, draws us together as one. And then in verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and watch this, and in you all. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ lives in your heart today? We, man, I'm telling you, I'm excited about this message. I'm really excited because if we would really grasp what Paul's trying to say right here and who he's, listen, the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians wasn't written to you. It was not written to me. It was written to the church at Ephesus, but it was written for us. There's a difference. And I want that to kind of make an impact today, okay? So um, the series that I'm going to be preaching is titled More Like Jesus. We need to look more like Jesus. We need to act more like Jesus. And, you know, when we think about who was Jesus, what did he look like? And Wednesday night I was talking with some of the, the teenagers, uh, and you know, I, I kind of asked them the question. I said, do you think Jesus ever had a good time with his disciples? And some of them were like, oh, I, I, I don't know. I said, do you think Jesus ever did a high five? And one of them spoke up and said, no. And they had Googled. This is how smart our kids are. They Googled when high five was invented. <laughs> is there such a thing? I mean, I, I was taken back. I was like, you can't get anything across these kids today. They're going to Google it. Let's just see if he's correct on this. And I believe it was like in the 1960s or something. Who, who was here Wednesday night? It was, it, it was, it was something crazy. It's like, oh, it was invented in 1960-something. I was like, what? I thought there was always high fives. Oh, oh, oh well. Now we got the fist bumps, right? I, mean, I was like, okay, well, never mind. Do you, I said, do you think Jesus ever played a prank on the other disciples? And they were like, well, I don't know. And I was like, I think Jesus was human. He was human. He had fun. He enjoyed his disciples. He enjoyed fellowship. And that's the side of Jesus that I think sometimes that we don't see. That you can still have fun. You can have fun in church. Amen. You, you can have fun when we come together. It, it's not about, I, this is the way I was raised, okay? You sit there and be quiet. <laughs> right? And I told you the story about when I was a teenager. I was sitting on uh, back there on, in the back. That's where the youth used to sit in my church. And I, you know, got out my pocket knife and you know I was bored during the sermon and I was you know just playing with my pocket knife and I look over at my dad and he's like and he's sitting over here in the middle I had to get up and walk over and sit there and I was you know you're going to pay attention you know and it, look I, I know we come to church for a purpose and it's for God to speak to us but listen we, we try to make it to where it's enjoyable that when you leave here you're saying that's why I want to be a part of the family of God that's why I want to be part of that church. I want to be part of something that relates to real life. I want to be part of a family who gets it. And that's why I want to preach this series of messages because these next four weeks, we're going to be talking about some characteristics and some qualities that we need as a church, that we need individually to make us be that church that God wants us to be, okay? Now, I'm not, I'm not trying, I know sometimes I got people to come up, you're always getting on to me during the sermon. And I'm like, yeah, I think that's God getting on to you, you know. <laughs> but anyways, I, I, I'm, I'm preaching this in a sense of it's the Word of God, okay, and we need to hear what the Word of God is. And 
and I brag on our church because we are doing a good work. But don't you think sometimes we could always do better, right? I mean, I remember the first time I scored a touchdown. I was like in the eighth grade. My coach gave me the opportunity to be a running back instead of being on the line. And I was like, I'm going to score a touchdown. And I scored a touchdown. And I was like, Coach, wasn't that good? And he's like, well, you could do better. You know, and I'm like, but aren't you glad that there are coaches who want you to do better? Aren't you glad that, that there are people that are always pushing you? And, and that's what I feel like as your pastor. I want to push you. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to be that better Christian, to live that walk that is worthy of the calling of what Jesus did. Because if we're going to call ourselves a Christian, don't you think we ought to look like a Christian? Don't you think we ought to act like a Christian? Absolutely. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Here's the four characteristics, or maybe you could even say the four attitudes that we should have individually. And when we have these individually, corporately, we come together as a church and we'll experience this together as a church. With all lowliness, there's the humility, gentleness, sometimes referred to as meekness, we'll cover that next week, long-suffering, which is patience, bearing with one another in love, that's kindness, okay? So here we go, be humble, be gentle, be patient, be kind, okay? There's the, that's the principle that, that Paul's trying to announce to the church at Ephesus, okay, it was specifically for that church. This is how you ought to behave. This is how you ought to respond. And this is the message for us today, that in our Christian walk, every day, everything that we do, we should be humble. We should be gentle, meek. We should be patient. And, and don't miss that third week, by the way. Don't, don't, don't skip out on that one. We all need that. And be kind. Be kind. Real simple Simple four weeks, but I, I, I believe that if we grasp really what's taking place, it's going to make a huge impact, okay? Now, why, why is this important that we see and, and hear about this? I want to take you to Matthew chapter 11, because if we're going to look like Jesus, don't we need to understand who Jesus was? What did Jesus look like? How did Jesus act? He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, um, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's, that's where we learn how to be a Christian. We learn from Jesus. And aren't you glad that we have the four Gospels? Because the four Gospels tell us about the ministry of Jesus Christ, what Jesus looked like, what he did, what he said. For I, watch this, am gentle and lowly in heart. That's the, the humility and the gentleness of of Jesus Christ, and you will find rest for your soul. So it's very, very important that we understand these four attitudes, these four qualities, and institute them into our personal lives. And once we do that, it'll take over our church. This is what our church will look like. We're going to be humble. I got that highlighted. That's going to be our first message today. Be humble. Next week's going to be be gentle. We're going to be talking about the gentleness of uh, and, and, and by the way, I, I got to start off with the opposites, right? I mean, what's the opposite of humble? It's pride, okay? What's the opposite of gentle? It's anger. It's the angriness that comes out. The opposite of patience, me. <laughs> the opposite of be kind is be rude, right? So we're going, to do, we're going to do what the Bible calls us to do. So let's get into it. What, what does humility look like? What does it mean to be humble? Well, we've got to look to Jesus, don't we? And there's two people in the Bible that stand out to be humble, the most humble people, and that's Moses and Jesus. And we're going to see that as, as far as meekness and that gentleness as well. So what does humility look like? And I think it's important that we start off with the fact that it does not look like pride. And, and what is Pride. I mean, that, that, that is the foundations of sin. When we go back to Genesis chapter 3 and we see the first sin that was committed, it was because of the pride. It was, it was Satan trying to introduce that pride into the heart of Adam and Eve and trying to say, you know what, God's trying to keep something from you that is good. You can be just like God if you eat this fruit. And there was a pride. You mean I can be like God? You mean I can act like God? Oh, I'm going to eat that. He's holding out something good for me. And sometimes that's the attitude that we have sometimes as Christians. But listen, we know what is most important. God knows what we need. And listen, 
and I hate to say this, but it's true. Sometimes God will withhold for our benefit because we're praying for something. Sometimes we pray for something big, and I, I know we're encouraged to pray big, big prayers, you know, pray big, pray for a big house, big car, big job, big, 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 pray it, speak it, and it'll happen, right? You hear those preachers saying that, but sometimes God's withholding for a reason, and maybe it's not the time, maybe it's not the place, or maybe God's trying to prune you to get ready for that, okay? Because sometimes... Even as we grow up as kids, right, you can't go from the first grade into the ninth grade over the summer, right? We get dumb during the summer, right? We can't just, oh, hey, I'm going into high school. I just completed the first grade. Now I'm ready for high school. Sometimes that's the way we act as Christians, right? We pray for these things. God, oh, man, I mastered that one. I'm ready. I'm ready for that check for a million dollars to come in the mail. And God's like, oh, you don't even understand. You're not, even, you're not even, you know, being a good steward with the little money that you're dealing with right now. And, and so there's lessons that we have to be learned. So what does humility look like? Three things I want to share with you, and they all start with the letter S. Humility is sacrifice. It's sacrifice. Now, let the scripture make it make sense. Paul says over in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. You, you see the selfish word. You see the self-ambition, right? That's pride. That's pride. I want my way. I want my voice to be heard. I want my way to be handled here. And, and, and listen, there's some people, that's the way uh, you walk into the room. I had to deal with this uh, this past week. Somebody walks into the room, and they start telling the pastor, this is what you ought to be doing. This is what you ought to be preaching. This is what you... In my, my, in my mind, I'm thinking, have you prayed about this? I mean, I, I'm the one that's been praying about it. Have you prayed about this? And they're trying to tell me because they're on the outside looking in. Oh, I could do better than that. I could, I could wear a fancier coat than he's got. I could look better. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness or humility of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. You see, if, if we're going to understand what humility looks like, it's going to begin with sacrifice. We're going to be sacrificing our own ambitions. We're going to be sacrificing our own, our own, uh, somebody help me out with the word I'm thinking about. Well, our, our own prerogative, right? Because that, that's what happens sometimes. We say, you know, you know, th this is what should happen. And, and, and we got to be very, very careful. But in lowliness of mind, in humility, that humility of Jesus Christ ought to take over. And then he says in verse 4, Let each of you look out, not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. You see, what Paul's trying to say right there is humility is sacrifice. You're going to sacrifice yourself. You're going to sacrifice the things that you want because maybe God's trying to do something in somebody else's life, Right? And maybe it's for them to come to know Jesus Christ. And maybe you just need to humble yourself and say, look, I'm going to sacrifice my own, my own things that I want to have taken care of, and I just, I just want to have unity. I just want to have unity in the body of the, of the family of God. And sometimes that's hard to do, okay, especially as a pastor. I'm just going to let you know, especially as a pastor, okay, because this is what happens. I'm just going to be real with you. A lot of people are looking at me. Well, pastor, you're the leader of our church. You're the shepherd of the flock. Whatever you say, that's what we need to do. That puts a lot of pressure on me. Okay? So the first time I say, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. And then somebody says, well, I don't think so. Well, you just told me <laughs> that I was in charge. Right? Aren't you glad we have elders? Because that's what it's all about. It's to have a team of elders. It's not just one person. It, it, it's to pray about these things. That's why we have deacons to serve. And by the way, we're going to be announcing here in, in the next couple of months some new deacons that are going to be coming in. We're going to be praying and we're going to be serving. And we want to share that with the church that, that we're on mission, okay? And, and we got to keep that mission. But let's continue. Also in James chapter 4, James, the half-brother of Jesus, wouldn't it be nice to live in the same house as Jesus? What do you think the half-brother of Jesus treated him like, you know? Here's a younger, old, older brother running through the house, you know, 
Mom's always saying, you're a perfect angel. Well, you do no wrong. And James is like, really? Really? I'm, I'm just here, right? But anyway, that, that's what I'm trying to say. Don't you think that Jesus had fun with some of that stuff? You know. But he, here's what James, the half-brother of Jesus, says in, in chapter 4, verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? That's something to consider, isn't it? Where does all this conflict come from, even in the church? Where does the conflict come from in our households? Where, where does all the conflict come in our jobs, in our, in our schools, in our everyday lives? Where, where, where does all that conflict, where does that conflict come from in our marriages? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? In other words, you're looking out for yourself. And somebody else is looking out for themselves. And when somebody's, you know, I'll just use my marriage for example, um, if I'm looking out for my own pleasures and my own desires, and my wife Stephanie is looking out for her own pleasures and desires, what are we doing? We're going opposite directions. But when we're considering what is good for the whole, when we're considering what's good for each other and what's good for the family, we're coming together. And that's that unity of coming together. And sometimes we have to sacrifice, right? I mean, sometimes... My family, they love certain restaurants. They love certain foods that I don't like. And they know it. And they wait for when I'm in a bad mood and they're like, we're going to go, we'd like to go here tonight. And I know what they're doing. They're trying to get us. I got a, I got a sermon for them. Let's be kind. It's coming in four weeks. <laughs> but, you know, when, when we think about this, there, there's times that we have to sacrifice. There's times that we have to sacrifice our own desires, our own pleasures, for the sake of someone else. And that's it ought to be quick. That's part of humility. You know, it's not about us. It's just not all about me. But we're living in a in a society today that it's all about me. And we we turn on the TVs, we watch these commercials, we watch these movies and it's doing nothing but saying you are the most important person. Feed your soul, feed your mind, feed your stomach. This is what you need. You know, and and we got this mindset it's all about me, 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 me. And when it's not about me, then we're upset. So, sacrifice. Number two, humility is service. When we think about what does it mean to be humble, we ought to think about it's to serve, to serve one another. Look at what Jesus says in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 24. Now, there was also a dispute. I highlighted that. Why is there a dispute? Because there's pride. What are, they, what are they talking about? Who among them should be considered the greatest? Well, that's pride at its best. The disciples of all people are understanding that Jesus is about to be leaving this earth. And what do they do? They have this little conversation among themselves. Well, who's the next leader? Who's going to be the next president? Who's going to be the next one to, to take lead in this organization? And they're having this dispute. And I'm telling you, every dispute comes from pride. Satan is trying to devour, and he's going to do this through conflict. He's going to do it through disputes, and he did it to the disciples who walked with Jesus Christ every day. So don't think that you're immune. Don't think that you're going to be able to walk away from this scot-free. Satan is going to try to devour you. He's seeking who he can destroy, and he wants to get you in the area of pride, that you don't humble yourselves to sacrifice your own desires, or that you want to serve one another. So Jesus sees what's happening right here. There's a dispute going on. So what, what happens now? So he, Jesus, said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. In other words, when you have someone serving you, you're benefited from it, aren't you? I mean, you go to a restaurant, you have somebody serve you, you're benefited from it. You didn't have to cook. You didn't have to clean. You didn't have to serve yourself. You had somebody there taking care of it. You benefited from it. And that's why the kings, they have servants. They have people that are serving them. Watch what Jesus says now. But not so among you. Jesus is trying to say, if you're going to be walking this earth as a Christian, you've got to get the world mindset out of your mind. You've got to understand that there's a new theology when you're a Christian, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger or the lower, and he who governs as he who serves. In other words, you're high on the totem pole, you serve someone that's under you. 
See, that's not the world concept, is it? No, we, we, we try to advance ourselves in this world. We try to make ourselves better. We try to hire people. We try to do certain things so that somebody down here is serving us. And then we see in verse 27, for he who is greater, he who sits, I'm sorry, for, for who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? He's asking, who, who's, got the, who's got the greatest position, him that's sitting at the table or who serves? And of course, is it not the one who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. And Jesus, of course, we see that he washes the disciples' feet. That is the greatest act of humility. He's serving his disciples. He's trying to show them, teach them. Don't think that you're all, all that. Don't think that you're high and mighty and you can't do something down here. All right? You act like a Christian. You act like a leader. You act like Jesus Christ and serve one another. Serve somebody. Don't think that you have to be served. Jesus says, I didn't come to be ministered to or served to. I come to serve. I come to serve others. So one point of humility is service, serving others. And isn't that, isn't that uh, what happens sometimes? The pride that gets in our minds. Well, who, well I'm not going to go serve them. I'm not going to do something. They need to get a job themselves, right? No, we've all said that, right? They need to get a job. They need to take care of themselves. Look, sometimes we just need to say God's tried to use us to share the gospel of love to someone else, and we do that through love, okay? So any of you that want to serve, anybody want to serve? Let's just get a hand. Does anybody want to serve? Awesome, because I'm going to have a U-Haul truck at my house today. At three, I saw your hands go up. I saw them. I'm just kidding. So there, there's times that, you know, we just don't feel like it, right? Don't feel like going to the food distribution. It's 165 degrees. I mean, the preacher's crazy thinking that we're going to stay out there all day. I mean, I, I don't want to go to vacation Bible school and teach and serve. It takes up the whole week and the whole month, and it's like, oh, oh, you know. But here's what's happening. We would rather do something for ourselves than do something for somebody else. You see how that's taking place in our mind? So in humility, we're saying, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that late trip to another date, and I'm going to go serve kids. I'm going to go serve our community. I'm going to go serve here. And that's what we try to do as a church is provide ways that you can serve. So when you're part of this church, it's, it's trying to get you involved and get you serving because once we start serving, then we can, we can be like Jesus. And we can look like Jesus and we can act like Jesus. Amen. How many of you look like Jesus? Oh, come on. Y'all are being humble now, aren't you? I was going to trick you. <laughs> All right. Third one, submission. Submission. What does submission look like? I mean, when, 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 when we think about submission, it's submitting ourselves, number one, to authority. All right. Now we've lost it as a society on that. We we're, we got this younger generation that's coming up. Hey, they don't respect the law. They don't respect children. I mean, they don't respect the the police. They don't respect parents. And listen, one day that's going to be our society. That's going to be our adults. We've got to get back to the basis of part of humility is submitting, submission. All right. Now, what does the Bible say about this? We go back to James chapter four, the half brother of Jesus. He says, but he gives, he, Jesus, gives more grace. Aren't you glad that we have the grace of God through Jesus Christ who saves our souls, who died on the cross to forgive us of our sins and gives us grace? Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. In other words, when, when you are humbling yourself and you have a mindset of humility, Grace is poured out on you. More grace is poured on you because that is what God is requiring of us. And God is trying to say, you're a humble servant and I want to pour my grace on you. We're not earning it. It's what God gives us because we're doing what he's called us to do. But then he says in, in verse 7, therefore, submit to God. Submit yourself to God. And watch this resist the devil and he's going to run he's going to flee 
Because he can't mess with the family of God. He can't mess with the child of God. Why? Because he's submitting. She's submitting to God. In other words, that person, maybe it's you, you're trying to tell the devil, devil, you can't touch me. I belong to Jesus. He died for me. What did you do for me, Satan? Nothing. Jesus died for me. He purchased me with his blood. That's why I serve Jesus. So get away from here, Satan. And that's, what, that's the attitude that we've got to have. Satan has nothing to do with it, but he wants to make you prideful. He wants you to have a proud heart because when he can get you prideful, he can get you in disputes, into conflicts, and, 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 and make you do and say certain things that you normally wouldn't do. Amen? We've all been there, right? Even I've said some things, and I'm like, where did that come from? It's because I'm not submitting myself to God. That is a daily walk that we submit ourselves to God. And when we're submitting ourselves to God, Satan's trying to say, I'm powerless. I have no power over you because you're submitting to God. And so don't you think we ought to submit to God every day? Have you ever seen a difference when we come in on Sunday? We're submitting, right? We're, we're holding up our hands. We're singing. We're praising. We're worshiping. We're submitting. And it's like we're in this whole different realm in our souls, and God is trying to say, that is my servant. That, that is who I'm well pleased with, right? And then we leave, and then we start saying what? What do, what do you want for lunch today, right? We start these selfish desires, right? And that's why fasting is so important. That's why we see in the Old Testament that they would fast at least one time a week, sometimes two times a week. They would fast to say, it's not about me. I need to quit having these selfish desires, right? You can take a look at me and say, I got some selfish desires. I could fast every once in a while, right? And, and that's part of, we got to say no to ourselves sometimes. We have to say no, but yes to Jesus. Hey, you may have to spend all night in prayer. You may not get to go to sleep. We love our sleep, don't we? Right? As kids, we hated taking naps. Now I'm looking for those naps. Man, I wish I could get a nap every afternoon, right? Can't wait till I retire. But yeah, I'm just kidding. When, when we think about are we submitting ourselves to God, what, what, what does that look like? In other words, we go back to all these other scriptures. We're saying that, that God's more important than anything in my life and that God requires me to serve one another, and that's more important than serving myself. And that makes a difference. So we come back to the list. Humility is sacrifice. It's service. It's submission. And look, it, it, it doesn't matter. This is how, if, if it's in the church, if you practice these three things in humility, watch the difference that it can make. In your marriage, use, practice these three things. Sacrifice yourself to your spouse. Serve your spouse. Submit yourself to your spouse. And watch what happens. Watch what happens. And I'm, I'm going to park right here for just a second. Husbands, men, you know what your wives, and I say wives, not spouses, wives, you know what your wives want from you? To be a spiritual leader. To be a godly leader in the home. And I'm going to say this, every man, husband in the room, even watching online, if you would submit to God, you watch what happens in your family. The order of operation happens. And, what, and that's what the book of Ephesians goes into chapter 6. It, it goes into saying, wives submit to your husbands. Well, I'm not going to submit to my husband because he does all this crazy stuff. I don't even like him anymore. I don't even know why I married him anymore, right? I mean, we, we got all this craziness going on. But husbands, if you would submit yourselves to God and you say, I'm going to devout myself to be a man of God, I'm going to stand for what is right. I'm going to do what is right. You watch what happens in your home. Your wives will naturally say, that's what I've been longing for. That's what I want in this house. I want to see a man who loves God, who loves his family, who loves his wife, and wants to serve us, and that has the family as the priority of his life. It makes a difference. But instead, what we see is men who work, and I, I'm not saying there's any in the church, but I'm just saying that in the outside world, outside of the church, we see that there are men that work hard all day, and they come home, 
and they do something for themselves and not be part of the family, not be part of the family unit. And then on the weekends, they're finding every opportunity to get away from the family. Go play golf. Go play this. Go do that. Go to the other. And what's happening? The, the rest of the family's like, where's dad at? Where's the husband at? I'm telling you, husbands, if, if you would get back to the basics of submitting yourself to God, watch what the difference will make. Watch what will happen in our families. Young men, if you'll learn this early. If, if, if you'll, when, you, when you get married and your wife asks you, just say yes. Just say yes. And yes, ma'am, will get you extra points. It'll get you some brownies after dinner. That's part of sacrifice. That's part of service. That's part of submission. It's coming together as one. It happens, happens in the church. But listen, we, we have to, well, it's the opposite of humility. It's pride. It's pride. And that's where Satan wants to attack. Satan wants, he did it to Adam and Eve. Don't think that you're immune. Satan wants to attack the church in the area of pride. Satan wants to attack you as a person in the area of pride. Satan wants to attack you and your family in the area of pride. And we have to pay attention to this and make sure that we understand, I'm not, I'm not going to let the devil get his way. I'm going to submit to God. Amen. I'm going to close with this verse right here, Luke 14, 11. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Right? If, we, if we're going to exalt ourselves, I'm the greatest preacher in the world. And somebody says, no, you're not. You're the worst. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. And that is where the bottom line hits right there. That if we just humble ourselves and do time in the right timing, God will exalt you. God will allow you to be exalted. Don't try to exalt yourself. Don't think that you're the greatest and the wonderful, you know. Hey, look. That, that's what the world tries to teach. But in the church, we're nobodies. We're nobodies, right? I mean, we're just, we're dumb people. No, that's not it either. But what we are, we're Christians. And we belong to Jesus Christ. Amen? And it will make a difference. So be humble. Be humble. And when you find yourself having these uh, personal desires and selfish desires and man I just wish I had this and I wish I had that and I wish I wish I wish something's happening and you need to humble yourself because Satan's trying to attack you in that area of pride all right that's the first red flag be humble be humble all right next week we're going to be talking about being gentle and what that truly means sometimes we have a false uh, negative about what that gentleness means we'll talk about that next week how many's going to be here next week you going to be here Okay, so I know a couple of families I'm going to put on the sign out front. I'm just kidding. You know i got to have fun with you. Um, to be honest with you, I think we had so many visitors last week it's because Tim wasn't here. Y'all notice that when Tim's not here? I mean, we have all these visitors that come in. Uh, but anyways, so glad you're humble. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for listening this morning. Thank you for being here. Can we be humble? I mean, that's what we're called to do. And, and, and if we find ourselves having these selfish desires, wanting to, hey, self-advance ourselves, look, wait and let God exalt you. Let God lift you up, okay? Um, so let's stand this morning. Let's, let's give a little time in prayer. Let's give a little decision time where we can reflect on what God would have for us and what God wants for us in our church, in our lives. And, 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 and I didn't didn't preach this this morning, but in all seriousness and the realness of it, sin, sin keeps us from being humble, okay? And, and I want to play this scenario. I know, I know you're already standing. Let's just, let's just say that I say a lie, okay? And somebody, Jeff, he comes up to me and he says, uh, Stephen, you, you, I caught you in this lie. What, what's the first thing I'm going to do naturally? going to lie again to cover up. Why? Because I don't want to be caught in a lie, right? I don't want to humble myself and say, oh, no, I lied. I, I sinned, right? So their pride just kicks into overdrive, and now I've got to say another lie to cover up that lie, right? And that's the way it works. And next thing you know, I've told a bunch of lies, and Jeff, just, well, he walks away. You know, and he's like, you're a liar. All you're doing is just lying. But that's how sin works. And here's what I'm trying to say. If we just confess our sins right now, 
and say, Lord, I, I know. I know that I messed up. I know that I told that lie. I know I messed up. And Lord, I know you're going to forgive me, give me another chance. You watch what happens. You watch what happens. That, that humility in your mind, because you've confessed and repented of your sin, makes a huge difference. Okay? So maybe in the next few minutes, we're going to have the prayer team. Y'all prayer team, come on up here. Maybe you just need to come take one of these by the hand and say, look, I, I, I just need prayer. You know, I'm really struggling in this area. Look, they're here. They have a heart to pray with you. I'll be here. I have a heart to pray with you. This is where we get things right with the Lord. And if you see an area in your life that God is, that, that needs to, um, he's trying to humble you, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, submit now. Because God will humble you. Okay? And it may be in front of a crowd. And we don't want that. Trust me. I've, I've been humbled before. We don't want that. So God gives us the opportunity to do it now before it gets too far. Father, we thank you today that we can come into your house. And Lord, we can search you. And Father, you tell us to seek you. And when we seek you, we know that you will be found. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to worship you today. Lord, help us to humble ourselves even right now. Lord, that we look like Jesus, that we act like Jesus. And Lord, that we come to our senses of knowing that we need to submit ourselves to you. That we'll sacrifice if we need to. We'll serve if we need to. But also, Father, we've already submitted at that point. So Father, we thank you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing. You come. Sing it out loud. Let's just sing this.